Hi, Corey. Hey, Eric. So here's your question to start us off. What is money? What is money? Uh, ah, that's a good question. Right? Yeah, it can get kind of heady. Whenever I, uh, I think of, of money and, and someone talking about money and whatnot, I, I think of Monty Python and, uh, and, and Eric Idle and, uh, and this. Which was a money program. Here he goes. Good evening and welcome to the money program. Tonight on the money program, we're going to look at money. Lots of it on film and in the studio. Some of it in nice piles, others in lovely clanky bits of loose change. Some of it neatly counted into fat little hundreds, delicate fibers stuffed into bulging wallets, nice yes. crisp clean checks, pert pieces of copper coinage thrust deep into trouser pockets, romantic foreign money rolling against the thigh with rough familiarity, beautiful wayward curlicued banknotes, filly great copper plating cheek by jowl with tumbling hexagonal milled edges, rubbing gently against the terse leather of beautifully balanced bank books. Now there's a good capitalist. Yeah, very nice. Into the money. But I don't know if that really answers that question of, of what is money, but we've got, like, um, I was thinking in terms of, of our coins. So we have, like, uh, this is one of, the, one of those newer nickels. Um, and so we say that's worth five cents. But if we look at this piece of metal... <laughs> That's not worth very much. That's a washer. <laughs> so you put that on a screw and then it's, so one of these is, is like legal tender and has a value. And, and one of these is just a hunk of metal. Mm. If you have a dime, that's this little guy. And this bigger guy is a nickel. But why is the little guy worth twice as much? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> it's almost then, like it's all arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's all made up. <laughs> And then you have these, you know, tell me what these are. Poker chips? Yeah, poker chips or, or casino chips. I don't know. Yeah, they're cheap, they're poker chips. But And these we just kind of assign money sometimes, and sometimes they're just a, uh, a piece of plastic. Yeah. There's this question like, what is money? And there's, there is a, a history to money in one of these... Uh, one of these handy websites you see out. And this was kind of interesting. They talk about how he started out with, with bartering like you would in, in older uh, civilizations. And then they started doing coins. And the, the original coins, it was almost like uh, it was the value of the metal, really, as much as anything. Uh, and you, it would almost be like trading in like gems or something with, with, for the original money. And then you started coming down to the concept of what they call representative money. And that's where you would start to put a, a value on it that's not really just straight up the, the value of the metal itself. Things like here, yeah, they're talking like the British pound and the pound sterling. And then, and then you get to the point of fiat money, which is where it turns into, it can be a piece of paper, and it, it's Latin for the word, let it be done. And it's just like this piece of paper. I was reading something that was saying that when Marco Polo got to China, they, they were using paper money. And in his experience, that wasn't a thing. And he was amazed at the idea that they would be trading in, in the market and would actually just buy something and just and just give this piece of paper for it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, what? This is just a piece of paper. But that's the, the whole idea of, of the fiat currency. It's just that the government decides it's a thing, it's the currency. Well, for a while there was the there was the kind of both the paper and the representative paper because like I was saying that the uh, pound sterling, the British pound sterling was based on pound of sterling silver. The U.S. Mm. dollar bill was gold backed until I think 1971. So that was that like paper money being the paper representative money turning into that paper fiat money. Yeah, and that kind of gets us into MMT. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the modern monetary theory. And the idea is, is this central concept that the, the government can make money at will. Right. It's really just, it's fiat currency. It's not tied to a gold standard anymore at all. Not since 71, I think. And be, because of that, it's not tied to taxes. It's not tied to anything specific. And when you get that kind of in, into your head that it's not this idea of that, you know, the taxes come in and the money comes out at the federal level, it, it can be kind of mind blowing because it really, it really becomes this concept of, you know, oh, they can just create the money 
whenever they want. And, and yeah, there, there are, there are limits. I mean, obviously if you go totally crazy and just make, make money and more and more of the money, it, it's going to lose value. But in a large economic system like the U.S. and like the Western world, there, there's so much money floating around that you, you can make an awful lot of it <laughs> and and do things with it. Oh. Yeah, I mean, we saw a lot of that during uh, 2020 and 2021 with a lot of the kind of stimulus and uh, protection loans coming out. Actually, kind of interesting thing on that, I, I read something that the uh, the PPP loans, the payment protection plan loans, paycheck protection, paycheck protection plan loans. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, They're offering um, some like debt forgiveness on that, but not for student loans, of course. (laughs) <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that gets into that, that concept of, of how we really saw, uh, the, the public really saw how much the government would be able to, mm-hmm. to print, um, money, um, for the purposes of, of aiding American citizens. And we kind of saw how, which ones, <laughs> which ones, we kind of saw how easy that was to do. And, and it's just interesting, um, you know, troubling really that, that, that we have that, that we see MMT and, and, and just look and see like, Hey, really like the people that are controlling the money, who are they serving? And then with MMT generally, there's there's kind of the, this idea of, of people who really don't really push back against the concept. Who think that it's really not a not a real thing, or that it's that it's out there or something. And I, I always I, I I think of this this meme of um, <clears throat> of you have the the guy who's maybe like a traditional economist who's saying you know no you you can't you can't do that you can't artificially inflate it you'll have a downturn you can't just Start bringing out, you know, and then of course the Federal Reserve just goes, ah, money printer go burr, burr. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> and and kind of the, one of the funny things too is you saw these memes go around a lot uh, in in relation to when the GameStop stock situation was going on with the with the Reddit Wall Street bets, and yeah, very much that was uh, like uh, the redditors and kind of like those fringe market people were doing the things that the that the Wall Street people do all the time. But of course, because it was like the the outsider people doing that, people were all worked up about that and the the people on wall street the people in the banks they, they understand mmt oh yeah <laughs> they, they they get how this works that that money is just a, a thing that the government creates it at will yep i thought that was interesting too because one of the things that, that richard wolf we, a lot of us know richard wolf he says well you know i, I know that we're taught these things um and he's referring to people that are kind of like in control of the the american financial system because he says well i went to school like literally we're classmates with, with janet yellen so he's like i know exactly what she was taught i was taught the same thing so yeah these this is not something that's that's new it's something that they're aware of and and you know they try very hard to make sure that we don't become aware of it as the general public and these these little little figures they have a name we we actually just just looked it up to remind ourselves again, but these these guys are called Wojaks. Wojak. <laughs> so if you hear the Wojak, it means it means this kind of guy, and and apparently it's also known as the Fields guy. Yes. <laughs> but the Wojaks. All right. A oh, funny thing too that uh, is just going back to before when there was like the gold back dollar is a uh, you know the, the joke is if if gold was was such this like valuable um, element then 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 why is like the majority of it sitting just in rooms and dark rooms somewhere in the basement doing nothing at all? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because in in reality it's it's not super like useful in like a materials engineering kind of way. So it's just uh, interesting how you know. Yeah, at least with diamonds. You yeah, know, they, they're really they're really hard. You, yeah. you actually have things like diamond saws, and diamond, diamond coated tools, yeah, diamond t- drills. So yeah. I guess you could have some value in that, but <laughs> yeah, I guess just one thing that that also kind of um, came into my, to my head thinking about going back to the barter economy. One thing that I think is interesting that I, I hear sometimes is a lot of people have this this miss. Um, kind of misunderstanding of this this barter economy as it used to be like it would be like oh you know i have five cows i'll trade you for 10 pigs or whatnot it wasn't really necessarily like that so much i think that prior to prior to that the economies were were more based on and we talk about this sometimes with the idea of like the federation dollar um like how in the future in the star trek uh series and the federation credits yeah Mm -hmm. and and so it's it's not exactly like money is being used to pay for basic human needs those are those are 
just provided. And so that's kind of how it was in the past too. Instead of like barter economies, what you really saw was they called them like labor-based economies where you basically um, would be just part of the group by, by providing your labor. So it would just be like a collective idea of, of collectively people in a community are taking care of of the community's needs and instead of like being like itemized and in charge for every single thing it would just be this based economy where you're saying like i'm providing my labor to do a service based on something that i can do and and that so you know i just like to point that out because i think that's a a, a misunderstanding that people have about being the barter based economy it's not that you need to it's not that you need to have assets to be able to trade you know it's it's that your your participation was based on you giving the services that you can do back to the society and the society takes care of itself collectively. And it's not all just based on how many pieces of paper you have in your pocket. Right. It, it was, it was, you know, what people really need to, to think about is, is how our economies today are not based on, on the survival of all the people in the economy. Whereas, you know, going back when, when, you know, humans were living in smaller, you know, sort of tribes or that kind of basis that the economy was based off of group survival. And so we've come a long way away from that. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the other thing I think of is a, a way that Caitlin Johnstone frames it. And she talks about how it's rather ridiculous that whether you, you live well or you, you live poorly, if you're, if you're rich or you're poor, it depends on, on how many numbers uh, our, our imaginary numbers are in your like imaginary bank account. Yes, and it's like, and, and we we just we we just take that as real, you know that that you know that's that's our value. That's that's why our wealth is just what's in what's in that bank. <laughs> It, it's it's not it's not a real thing necessarily. It's it's not. I mean, you're in t- you're almost like um, the majority of like rich people's net worth is probably intangible. You know, so the way I I like to frame it sometimes is 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 money is fake. You know, but it sure feels awfully real when you don't have any <laughs> or you don't have enough. That's very true. So then into our uh, the next question I have for you. Sure. What is the purpose of taxes? What is the purpose of taxes? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. pe- people would probably say to, to pay for, for services. Um, I don't... If we were doing Family Feud, that would come up number one. Ding! Yeah, that yeah that would <laughs> probably be like the, the real common ones. I'm not sure that I, I, I believe that, though. What, what do you think on it? Yeah, it's, um, you know, and it's one of those MMT things that when when you get to the the federal level level or more accurately when you're talking about currency issuers you you know you have the issuers versus the currency users and so if you're a currency issuer then you don't need anything (laughs) to create the currency you you do literally create it out of thin air because you can't because it's it's your fiat and so this this linkage between tax dollars and the tax budget how much how much taxes are coming in is really an arbitrary construct. It's, um, it can be useful to have kind of, um, to kind of have a judge of, of how much money you should be making and, and what may cause inflation in a, in a general way. But this idea of, of linking it directly and having things like um, pay go, you know, pay as you go type of laws where you have to, uh, reduce spending in other places to have spending elsewhere i mean it's it's um it doesn't have to work that way you know it, it's not some some cut and stone cut and stone thing but it of course is is very convenient when they want to be uh talking about things that they don't want to pay for like the social programs and education and stuff and uh, medical you know health care then all of a sudden it um it becomes, you know, well, what's what's the budget? What's what's the comparison to the tax dollars? Whereas when it gets into other things like, of course, military spending and and banking and Wall Street and tax cuts, they which are a, it, yeah. a form of spending, they they just do it. Yeah. So along those lines, there's there's like I, I gotta say, like, like whenever I hear people, especially like like um, hosts on the left talk about uh tax dollars they say you know this is where our tax dollars are going i actually get a bit triggered now <laughs> because I, I you know and i just want to i just want to like like put in you know hashtag learn mmt <laughs> in there because it's 
and and the reason it, it isn't just because of of the academic thing of you know well that's how it actually works or whatnot but it actually has um it has consequences when 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 it's put that way you know i don't want my tax dollars going towards this or that by that logic you're actually saying then that if someone pays more taxes then they have more say in how the money is spent is is essentially what you're endorsing when when you kind of when you kind of frame it that way because if that's what taxes are for then you know if, if you're paying more taxes then you should have more influence yep, definitely and yeah that 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 kind of thinking also kind of breeds i, I think a lack of empathy because we talk about sometimes how a lot of these social programs they're not being supported in public is, is kind of due to this lack of empathy if you have it in your head that it's like your tax dollars like you said rather than just thinking of like this collective thing that's being done by the government people will get in their heads oh well you know i don't support this i don't want to support that with my tax dollars but in, in reality it's 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 as you're saying not like that it's not like it's being tied to individual dollars and of course that's going to be a political tool that the oligarchs and the and the ruling people can can use as as weaponized against the voters and you know rile up tribal fights and whatnot and, and and you can get into things like like when when you're trying to get the rich to pay more in taxes, you'll have these arguments like, you know, well, they're already they're already paying most of the tax burden, so, so why should they have to pay more? It's not it's not fair. Yeah. So you know, and that gets us back in into the question again, you know. But that, so then, what are taxes for? And you know, f- from my understanding of it, and the way I look at it, is it's about cycling the money back in. Is one basic, basic idea of it. You can't just um, create fiat currency and just put it out there indefinitely. It has to be cycled back in. I've heard of um, concepts of like the velocity of money, of mm-hmm. it going going out and then and then coming back in. And so, I mean, there, there's that basic concept, but then there's the idea of of how do we want to tax people and there can be real purpose and intention when it comes to that um, and it gets into the wealth inequality and so if we decide that we want to have a society that um, that the wealthy people just get more and more wealthy more wealth and more power and whatnot then then we kind of uh, cut their taxes <laughs> and then they they can gather more money and the rest of the the 99 percent who just have the 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 regular taxes then we fall further and further behind whereas if you have a progressive tax system where you're actually charging um more higher rates for people who are have more money or more wealthy then you can actually use that as a tool to work towards the goal of, of wealth equality rather than the huge wealth inequality. And there's really, there's really been a, um, a real, uh, I, what I call it a decades long program by the, the ultra wealthy to, to shift that tax burden so that it, um, that's part of, of how they got wealthy. That's part of how they increase their wealth. Um, and it's it's a real tool and and I, I think what we on the left really need to get serious about is recognizing that taxes and tax distribution are, are a tool that we should be using uh, to demand uh, progressive taxation and progressive tax systems to to claw back this wealth inequality yeah and uh, also it can be a good rallying point too because as it affects the majority of, of working Americans and Americans that are going to be voting, um, you know, it's something that we can rally behind. And you see the way they do it in terms of, you know, these, these stories about like Amazon paying no taxes and, and the and the billionaires reducing the, you know, their tax burden with every every trick in the book and in accountants. And you know, whereas the 99 percent just keep on paying the same way. Right. And it also... Uh, becomes an issue when you have uh, prioritization on like private charity and stuff like that because a lot of times what will happen is is you know to shift blame and divert from from millionaires and billionaires going out there and saying oh we're not paying our fair tax burden they'll do big donations to charitable foundations and whatnot so this is something we need to push back on in terms of of arguing as to why we need the tax reform rather than just allowing billionaires to you know shift money through charities for that purpose 
Yeah, it's like you, you can keep your donations and pay your taxes. <laughs> Definitely. And then it, it, it's it's about control as well because when when they're doing these donations and it's their pet projects, and you, you got people like Bill Gates out there just you know just deciding you know which disease he wants to target that year you know that that's got him, his interest or what pet project, and you know what what we should be doing is is having a government that represents the actual people and that um is able to uh spend money you know that that benefits the 99 percent absolutely with the with the billionaires and the wealthy within a certain uh part you know if within a certain part of the population there's almost this, this uh, obsession with them you see that a lot with people with that with elon musk is that you know they're going to be the billionaire savior class and that's something that we absolutely need to be fighting against so then the other thing um i makes me think of is is the whole concept of the federal deficit and you know the the, the whole concept of, of the federal deficit it, it it's like a, a monetary psyop i mean it's it's not a real thing i mean the, the the federal deficit is like it's an accounting total of just the the the, the number that's the federal spending and the number that's the tax revenues. Now, now you can decide that these need to be equal, or, something, or you can decide that they don't. Um, but the, the way it gets used, you know, and you have like the debt clock, and I mean, uh, you know, it's another thing on the left. I, I think we, we just really need to start recognizing that as, as a psyop, as a as propaganda. Yeah, I agree. It definitely should be called out too, because really, it's one of those things that only comes up when it's convenient to the narrative that they want to push, and mm-hmm. other and other times it does not come up at all. And then you have kind of the idea of, of like, if you, if you have the federal debt, you know, well, the the Fed could just print money to pay it off, or if there are like, you know, like, like any any federal borrowing is is a policy choice. It's not. It's not like, you know, it was needed or we, we wouldn't get the roads and bridges without it or we wouldn't, you know, be able to, to fund the military or something without it. It's a policy choice. And in a monetary system, I mean, you, you can have, um, you know, it does, it's not necessarily crazy to have things like bonds and that, you know, that operate as, as debt and go back and forth. But it's really down to with these policies, who they benefit, you know, who who's in, cro- who's in control of them and who... You know, are, are they are they helping with with the whole society in the ninety nine, or or are they going to the ultra wealthy on top and increasing the wealth inequality, which you see more often than not because, of course, you know the billionaires and the megacorps at this point at this point uh, control our government, <laughs> and that's another thing we got to work on. Right, and the uh, federal deficit or federal debt will also get used as a tool uh, to push foreign policy narratives and to push for the political there's a lot of like china and russia baiting and and whatnot that goes on with with talks around the the federal debt and economy so just another uh weapon that that they can use to to continue to have the people fight about and talking about that rather than the actual issues at the root of the money and sometimes there's this idea of of, uh, of minting the coin have you heard that one you know mint, mint the coin and the idea is that the uh the the treasury can can mint currency of any type and of any value that it chooses and so you the 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 treasury could mint a um a trillion dollar coin and just deposit it into um into the account and then um and just spend on it right and i i think it's useful as an exercise to kind of uh get it into people's heads that this is all a game (laughs) this is all uh it doesn't have to be this whole thing of, of like a household budget where you only have so much money. Um, but you don't, you don't even really need a coin. I mean, it's just an act of Congress can just create money. Right. I mean, that's just the simple reality. I mean, sometimes people like to frame MMT like it's some, it's some plan or some weird out there theory or some policy that, that we could you know, work towards, but it's kind of weird and whatnot. But all it really is is um, is just a description of how things really work <laughs> and how federal spending really works. Yeah, I mean, money and currency itself is almost just one thought experiment. <laughs> the whole thing, right? Right. You mean it's all made up? It's all made up. <laughs> and then, in, um, and then when we had the the big crash in in two thousand and nine, you really saw um, how easily they created a bunch of money 
and and just um, and just delivered it out to bail out the banks, bail out the big companies, the big businesses. And you know, you would have thought that more people should have kind of figured it out after that. That um, that Congress, that the government, can create money and do what it wants with it. And then now we had our our more recent you know, COVID uh, pandemic crash, uh, or you know, downturn, however it worked out. You know, but where they created lots of of money. Um, one way I heard it described of is uh, they basically shot a money cannon at Wall Street, <laughs> and you know it, it, what it makes me think of is that you know when you when you do that kind of money creation, um, it certainly can create inflation potentially. And where it really created inflation was on Wall Street, <laughs> all the stocks went up, right? And the billionaires, you know, their their profits went up. You see these these mega corporations, and and they all made out, <laughs> and. You know, I think you can draw really a pretty direct connection between um, between the the federal between Congress just creating that money and those profits. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and it's it's money that's that's being created, but uh, in the public sector and going into the private sector. So that that's money that was printed by the government to try to ameliorate an economic situation, and it's being siphoned out into private pockets constantly by the wealthy. And you had one of the things that I heard about that that, that it's happened is that when when we had the two thousand and nine crash, the um, they had to have um, acts special acts of Congress to to kind of generate that money and funnel it out and do that stuff. And now, from what I've heard, the Fed is, has been empowered to to do those kind of things automatically. This is why you didn't necessarily hear. You, you don't hear a lot about what happens now because the federal bank you cre- just creates a lot of money and pushes it out to the big banks, to Wall Street, and it, it, they just have to like see a systemic risk there, or something like that. And I, from what I understand, to a large extent, they're they're just empowered t- to do that. Whereas, of course, when it's something like healthcare or education or social spending, everything turns into a debate and and a long process. Um, I mean, they, they couldn't even get really a, this minor infrastructure bill to really <laughs> go through with, with anything real on it. So one of the things that the MMT people I've heard talk about a lot is, is they like to tie it into a federal jobs guarantee. And one reason why that works well is when you're talking about creating this money, whether or not it'll create inflation, how it will work in the economy, the way, I, the way I've heard it described is that it, it's it's about whether the 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 greater economy can absorb it if there's one way i've heard it framed is that if the federal government decides it wants to employ a like like a whole bunch of plumbers let's say and so if out there in the society there's there's not a lot of plumbers and the and the federal government starts hiring a whole bunch then the price for plumbers is is going to go up because they're they're going to get more scarce and it's a market and that's how it works but but if you had a situation where you had a whole bunch of unemployed plumbers sitting around w- looking for work and, or underemployed, and then you hire them with federal dollars, not taxpayer dollars, federal dollars, then it, it actually is really good for the economy. It gets into uh, that, that money kind of uh, circulates around and you, you give them jobs, you get them working, and it's not going to have the same kind of inflationary effect on on the the plumbers and their salaries because they weren't they weren't making plumber salaries before that and so the federal job guarantee kind of works in a similar way in that you're you're giving people good jobs better jobs you're covering unemployed people and it's just a a, it's just a really good tie-in to the, the whole mmt theory and that whole kind of systemic thing and it's a way to to really make that um, the system and the ability to to create money to make that really work and to work for the society in general and not just for the ultra rich yeah for sure definitely one of the things that we've talked about too on the show is is how it's a shame that in public schools you don't have a lack of of kind of 
education about these topics. So what you're going on to is something that people that don't have a basic education uh, provided to them on economics. That that is is, is something that that really could be uh, could be used more. That's a good point. Mm. Because it's tricky though, because it seems like uh, economists aren't uh, <laughs> aren't trained in a way where they they seem open to the idea of MMT. <laughs> that is a good point. I, I guess you know probably the the kind of college economics departments are, are maybe a little Need bit some reworking. Yeah, maybe a little bit kind of uh, bought and, and and influenced by similar how you have the the journalism schools. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's a good point too. But you know some some. A fair and balanced economics education is something that definitely the, the public could use a lot more. And any other place you, you can get pushback on this is is that you know sure the federal government works that way, but the the state governments and the municipals don't right. work that way. Right. They're they're tied to their tax dollars and and what they work on in bonds and whatnot. But but I mean what I would say is it it doesn't have to be that way. And this is one of the things that that I, I feel like people on the left should be really should be really more open to this idea it, it doesn't have to be that way we, we we can come up with with innovative ideas and solutions to to work on on things we don't have to be tied into the way things are now so with 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 this concept of of the tax dollars at the state level well you could run federal programs run the system so that all of the state and municipal governments are funded f- from federal dollars on a per person basis you just pass the law, pass the, set up the system so that you come up with a per person number for the whole country, and you say every state government is uh, going to get that amount on a regular basis, and you, and you just fund it, and the sky's not going to fall if you do that. It's not going to it's not going to go crazy. You would just work things kind of differently as far as you know how you you route the money and the tax payments. It would be it could be a really good chance to simplify things. Absolutely. And just come up with a simple tax system. You know, we, we could have a tax system where anyone making under 200 grand pays zero. I yeah. Mean, what if you wiped out all of it? All, all the taxes for anyone who's poor and figure out what that line is and have a progressive tax system from there. And you would systemically be addressing the wealth inequality. You would you would be clawing clawing down that wealth. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good move too because uh, I think back when we were talking about the the potential um, move, the move to amend the the potential constitutional amendment that move to amend had written out. It's a very very simple and succinct mm. uh, piece of proposed legislation. The Constitution is like that too. Uh, very very simple, uh, able to be understood and read by a lay person without legal education. It's like that on purpose. And so tax law and tax code is, is incredibly complicated. You know, you need to not only be a lawyer but be specialized in tax law to understand any of that. So I, I, I think you know, that's a good opportunity that you said to tear it all down and build it back up. Because if, if you have laws and financial economic laws, tax-based laws that, that are completely un, untenable and unreadable by a member of the general public, then you have an issue. The economic elites and the mega corporations, they use that to their advantage. Absolutely. That's, that's part of their game, is to make things so complicated that you, know, you, you have to have those kind of resources to even understand it. Definitely, because that's 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 the two tiers of the haves and haves not when dealing with the system is when you have the the financial means to hire these money lawyers and whatnot. Now all these major corporations, rich people, they have these armies of lawyers that are doing this for them. Something that the average working class person has absolutely no uh, access to. Access yeah. to, yeah. So the other thing I, I thought of in all this is uh, the what's called the petrodollar, and the the petrodollar connects in with oil and and it, it's a system by which um, the oil sales are made in dollars and um, it becomes kind of a, a trade-off of, of playing ball with 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 the u.s and the in the west it's like, like with saudi arabia especially you see that the u.s having this very cozy relationship and as long as the the saudis and opec sell their oil in dollars then then they get essentially like a protection racket. I mean, they, yeah. they, they get to use the U.S. military sometimes, and especially the the arms. They get to to make use of those and buy those and yeah, and do very become very powerful that way. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a strange situation. It's almost as if that we've you've mercenaried the the United States military because as opposed to the above board 
or organizations other like NATO, which are these uh, defense compacts, the agreement that we have with the Saudis, it's it's not only for defense. They they've they've called us in for offensive operations too. So it's this very very strange situation. Yeah, and and the Saudis become rich off of it. You, right. You, and in the Middle East in general, you have these these families and these you know, oligarchs, what we should call them, who get just hugely rich in in dollars and so then they can spend money all all over the place this was just one random example i found is that the the chrysler building is 90 percent owned by uh, people in uh, you know oligarchs in abu dhabi wow (laughs) that's very very it's all bloody money too bloody bloody money it's a whole big you know money system well some of the there's been some interesting foreign uh, affairs stuff going on with the petrodollar too recently too um, hasn't hasn't Joe Biden kind of not been? It's kind of hilarious because I, I I do think that that Biden through all this stuff with Ukraine and Russia and the Russian oil and is is wrecking the petrodollar. Yeah, it seems like it. <laughs> it's like yeah, okay, if you want to wreck the petrodollar, I mean, you got Putin demanding the, that oil now will be bought in rubles. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I I don't I think it's. <laughs> It's kind of amazing that they can be so in- incompetent that they can wreck something that's so powerful. In it's their strange. Interest. And yeah, I mean, th- th- that is one thing with 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 elites is is there there's this assumption that that they're really smart and that they're really that they know what they're doing. And there's there's example after example that that these elites really really aren't. <laughs> they're they're not that smart. They're connected. They, they have resources, they have family connections, but this idea that, you know, that, that they're all brainiacs and, and they plan everything out and it's all, it's really not the case. And, and you know, examples like the Iraq war, I mean, it's, it's a total fiasco. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's part of the reason why it's such a big deal that we need to get uh, reform of the law and reform of the money system because yeah we're all we're all humans they're they're no different than us the difference that they have is this a massive amount of money and capital and wealth and so what happens is because with the money system and the legal system being so intertwined they almost don't care to, to cover up their tracks and yeah a lot of the stuff can be really transparent that they do because they have these armies of, of lawyers that that they have to insulate them from from power and the other thing i, I think to remember about about the the corporate economic elites is is that they're they're totally cutthroat. Yes, they, there's there's not they're, they're not a monolith. They they don't they they don't work in lockstep. They they have common interests, and so there is this this set of interests um, among that top point one percent that's very different from the interests of the ninety nine percent. But there's and that's always important to remember, and that's you know, that's why we get the laws we do. You know, it's how they bought Congress and why Congress does what it does and what it doesn't do. But I think it's also important to remember that they they'll cut each other down. I mean, they'll they'll even they'll even screw over themselves for like a better quarter. <laughs> it's they're they're it's very much a Game of Thrones situation. Yeah. And so if, if you could potentially find the situation to, to pin them against each other, you know, that could be advantageous to the rest of the public. But And it happens. Yeah. You'll see like Silicon Valley will be opposed to what the, uh, the energy sector is doing and they'll and they'll they'll tussle and social media. You know, you'll see a tussle between that and and other interests. You have Hollywood, and they, they're not they're not always completely in alignment. And in theory, if if we of the ninety nine percent can be working collaboratively for our common interests, and and poke at things that divide them up, I I, I do think there are like real opportunities there. We can kind of kind of figure out those those fissures, those those things to to kind of crack open the the power structure. I, I think it's possible. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that that using their their greed against mm. each other is definitely part of a multi-pronged takeover that can happen. So then in terms of solutions, cuz that's it's something that I really always like to hit on is is what are the the potential solutions. I do feel like a lot of even the, the the people I really like on on the left, there is a real tendency to to focus on the problems and call out the the problems and and list them and call them out, 
and get mad about them. And, and all that is, is crucial. All that is, needs to be done. But we also need to be thinking about what's, what's a step two, what, what are the potential solutions? Because if we don't have any to offer, then I, I don't see how this movement is, is really going to, to have legs to really spread and, and succeed. You got to be giving people something to hang on to, to, to look at. I mean, I hate to use that word, but to, the word, but to, to hope for. I mean, if you're going to have a movement, I mean, you have to have something for people to hope for in there. What I find works is to to really focus on the money in that when you're when you're focusing on 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 the money and looking at how the money works and where and where it goes, it, I think that can guide you towards solutions. So it's like what what's our issue with the money right now? Well, you have billionaires and mega corps with tons of money, and they're using that money to buy our corrupt Congress and to get the laws passed and and so things operate in their interest and not in the interest of the 99 percent and so if you're focusing on on that that money then that's where you really want to try to cut that cord between the economic elites and the congress the representatives that are supposed to be representing us and so i've tried to to hit some of that in my list of proposed demands or that i've been working on and i'll just show the one in here the uh, number eight that's about addressing the influence of big money in politics and government and really viewing this as you know the core issue because it's it's how they they own the congress it, it drives everything else and so if you're talking about at, at the state and local level um, it's things like clean elections and public financing of campaigns it's possible to do these things i mean massachusetts had a clean elections law in the past it really comes down to demanding these things, to getting in the streets over these things, I'm serious about them. Definitely, yeah, definitely. It also seems like it's it's probably going to be a little bit easier uh, to to begin with at the state level. And then at the federal level, you basically you basically got to amend the constitution because right now money is speech, corporations are people. Right. You're gonna as long as we have a Supreme Court that interprets the laws and the constitution that way, it's going to be difficult to to pass really serious campaign finance reform and, and public financing and things like that with, with teeth because they'll they'll twist it. They'll they'll twist it in all kinds of ways into being like they'll they'll take other uh, parts of the constitution, the Bill of Rights and saying, you know, you're you're depriving them of their due process because you're not letting them spend you know, spend all their money. And it's ridiculous, but it but it works because enough people are, are corrupted in, in the system. If you look at the proposed amendment that the move to amend folks have out there, the weed of the people amendment and it's and it's real simple. Like you mentioned earlier, it's yep. real simple. Artificial entities, such as corporations, do not have constitutional rights. Money is not free speech. That's your basic amendment. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it gets into a little more detail, but you know, that's your amendment. I, I think if we made something like this, the cornerstone of a left movement, it, it could be a, a dividing line, a, a thing of where you're really pressing candidates and representatives to say, you know, are you really for this or, or aren't you? Yeah. And this is very possible. It's not something that we want to get cynical about. This is this is possible to happen and, and worth fighting for. There are things that, you know, we, we can be doing is, you know, there are potential solutions i see it as you know we need to be making demands and we need to really get difficult about those demands i think on the left we need to have ideas out there that we kind of that we're, we're thinking about maybe you know out of the box things even like like we could take we could pass a federal law to and just say the maximum lending rate is five percent period yep, just absolutely. everything that, that's the cap you know, we, congress can do that <laughs> And that, you know, that, that could be passed, you know, and you got to ask why is that happening? I mean, who, who's against that? <laughs> is, is the 99% against that? <laughs> I don't think so. I agree. But I, I, I feel like we're almost like not trying <laughs> for, for some of these things. We're not really pushing and, and trying to make use of our, of our numbers. You could have um, things like, like I was saying earlier, you know, you could eliminate taxes you know below like a certain income level 
you know, and that could even be like 100, 200 grand and just have those taxes be progressive taxes on, on the higher incomes, get rid of, you know, get rid of all the taxes, get rid of the sales taxes. I mean, and just simplify it and just have a high income tax, have a wealth tax. If you really did that, you know, the, the effect would be transformative as far as the, the wealth inequality situation. And you, you do the same thing with, with businesses. I mean, I don't hear, hear this. I mean, sometimes you hear it talked about with small businesses and how they're having trouble, you know, how they would have trouble paying minimum wages and things like that. Well, you know, you, you could have progressive um, business and corporate taxes where if you're a small business in let's say less than 100 employees your your corporate tax is zero you can do that and shift the tax burden to the big boys where oh, it belongs yeah. yeah one of the i think one of the biggest um you know magic acts that the republican party has managed to pull off is convincing small business owners that they're for them mm. and yeah well if you're for them then cut their taxes to zero yeah <laughs> small business owners should be very interested in progressive politics because they're not they're not the businesses being um, taken care of right now that's for sure and I mean you can even go the other way almost to like reverse taxation and you know shifting federal dollars to small businesses absolutely just in a real way yeah so we've been talking about money you know what money is there's even the whole concept of electronic money like like when I was showing when I was showing the, the the coins and things, the other the other thing I could be showing, you know, this is money too now. Yep, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, all that, yeah. The, the phone, I mean, it, it's electronic, and, and that so you think of, of PayPal now and how how PayPal's been turned into an inst- instrument of censorship now, and it, it's you know, money is money is power. It's yes, it's a real thing. And money is power. Money is speech. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is right now. I mean, I, I guess it always will be in, in to some extent, but it's just it's just gone way too far. And the ninety nine percent that I keep referencing, you know, we we need to find our power and, and leverage our numbers. Yeah, definitely. I think we should also be suspicious and and keep an eye on on w- of what parts of the government are, are being actively funded um you know mm. one of the problems is that you'll budgets see, are power yeah then. budgets like the police first responder budgets compared to other areas you know be, be suspicious and, and wherever you live look at what what money is going to the budgets in some some jurisdictions uh the police which is almost like it can be sort of a, a tie-in to the military industrial complex can be having a lot of budget money budgets going to the police when not going into schools and social programs you have like a an agency like the new york city police department it's i think would be in the top 25 of of militaries in the world just based off of its budget and, and amount of staff it's something we just, should be very suspicious think about of. that you know it's it's like a foreign military yes <laughs> it's just just there <laughs> just right operating and and they operate outside of the city too absolutely oh yeah the the nypd actually i know for a fact they have offices outside of of new york outside of the country i i know at least that they have one substation i think in israel that for for just a municipal police department to to be doing international operations i'm not i'm not claiming that there's a lot but it does exist it's uh it just makes you wonder because it's not really what a local municipal police department should really be be doing but if you think about the capital police i know that some people pointed out the they just got a big boost yeah i know people point out hypocrisies that some of the members of like the squad and whatnot supported that um it's 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 very transparent when they do that because it, it goes and it shows who they're really interested in which is their own interests you know we already established that that police you know it has its the, the police department they as it exists today has its roots in in slave catching and in uh, protection of private property and enforcement of property laws and so that's what the capitol police is not a lot of people know this the capitol police they also do personal protection for members of congress so like nancy pelosi she has a capitol police detail similar to secret so service important. yes similar to like a secret service type thing i'm not i don't think every single member of congress has their own personal detail but the the ones that you see in in the news all the time definitely do i think senators all do um, I'm any, struck by the arrogance of these people. Yeah, but, but that's another topic. <laughs> and and also all the all the money that they just flooded into the Capitol Police because they they were saying that it's going to be detecting and preventing future acts like the January 6th stuff. They they've almost turned it from a federal law enforcement agency into like a federal like intelligence community type agency. 
So that's just something we should definitely continue to be suspicious of and, and question any kind of major increases into the police departments, especially considering that we're not really seeing a, a benefit to the general public. We should be demanding cuts. Yeah. It's like we should be demanding cuts to the military budget. Right. Start cutting it, period. Absolutely. And, yeah, also with with that, any cuts, just be very suspicious of, of how rises in crime that they're alleging might be twisted in terms of that. So then when we're talking about policing and, and criminal justice, you know, we, we can also be looking at at, at our, more of our local police and, and justice systems and our courts. And, and there's, there's a real economic tie into that that I know you wanted to talk about. Yeah, definitely. So I wanted to bring up a uh, bail, the topic of bail, real, real quick. So, um, yeah, this is a this is from the Prison Policy Initiative, um, a National Criminal Justice Think Tank. Uh, this is an article that they have here about um, detaining the poor, or the bail system. So, essentially, uh, bail has been around in in European common law for a while. Which, for if you don't know, a lot of the American law kind of goes back into into common law in England and whatnot. But uh, essentially, the the big thing here is a lot of people know that like bail is when you, know, you get arrested and you you end up in jail, and bail's you know what you post to get out. So essentially, bail is a uh, is kind of like an insurance. the The big thing is bail is not supposed to be punitive. It's not supposed to be a punishment. I'll come back to that after because that's something that people argue that it's become. Uh, bail is uh, guaranteed as as a, as a constitutional right by the Eighth Amendment. So what the purpose of bail is essentially insurance that you're going to show up to your court date. So like I said. Uh, it's it's not supposed to be punishment. It's just supposed to be an and deposit a safety deposit that you're going to show up to court, and then when the offender shows up to court, in theory, at the end of the court proceedings, as long as they show up, they get that money back. Um, so, one way that bail creates this this two tiered system and and the criminal justice system, the haves and the haves nots is is one based on just the the, the potential or possibility to pay bail. So bail is handled differently in different jurisdictions, but essentially what you'll have is you'll have some officer of the court that makes this decision of can you uh, can you be released on your personal recognizance? Personal recognizance be- means that you're being released on your word. They're just saying like, look, we trust you that you'll show up. You're being released personal recognizance or by by cash. They'll set them some number or uh, or denied bail. Them being denied bail would, would likely have to go to to a court to determine that they're either a flight risk, so they're they're likely to leave the jurisdiction, or they're a danger to the public. Um, so the problem here is 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 one you just have to do with the access of of bail really only for most people that that we're not dealing with a, se- a severe like violent criminal because being denied bail would be only something if there was like a very serious violent crime bail really only applies to the poor because if you're rich you, you don't even think about it it's just like uh, I heard, heard this anecdotal story that that somebody was like talking to a rich friend and they were driving around a city and they said, uh, "Oh no, you can't park there because their friend who was rich is going to park and, and pull into a spot." And they said, oh, "No, I can park there. It's just sixty dollars, right?" And so that's kind of how the wealthy will think about the criminal justice system: is like, yes, I can do these things. It's it's just like a bill. Um, so bail really only does affect in in a, in a severe way the people that money is tight or working class people because otherwise you wouldn't have to worry about that. So and the problem is that bail is generally based off of um, the quote unquote severity of the crime or the record and not based off of the person's ability to pay. So what that uh, would mean is you the the system is not taking into account that that person's ability it's not taking into account their assets it's not um something that's like uh oh this is one percent of of your money made over time so you can have people that are poor uh struck with very high uh, absurd bail amounts that would be like a hundred thousand dollars no way that you're going to come have show up with that in cash so you could actually argue that that type of bail is unconstitutional considering that the eighth amendment does uh does argue that bail is a right and so if you have bail that's excessively high that that no reasonable person would amount to be able to to come up with then you're going to have that issue some i've heard also talked about move to um abolish cash bail yeah so that would be uh, basically having bail arrangements that would be 
alternatives such as um, in Massachusetts, we don't have bail bondsmen. So bail bondsmen are, are essentially like loan sharks that that, li- that lend for bail money. The reason that you don't have a bail shark or bail bondsman rather in a state like Massachusetts is because we have uh, cash bail alternatives where the person that that's being released out on bail has an arrangement where they can pay like a lower percentage direct and that that takes care of their bill situation. Yeah, I mean, another another uh, way to think about the bail is is that so you have uh, jails and prisons. So in prisons, you have people that are being uh, that have been convicted. Jails are generally uh, split up into two sections. One is that of people that are convicted for misdemeanors. Jails also sometimes known as house corrections, and they're people that are doing shorter term sentences. Jails also hold pretrial defendants. So that makes up about 70% of, of jail populations. And so those are people that are in jail but awaiting trial, sentencing. They're still going through the court proceedings. They are legally presumed innocent. That, that's what you have in the Fifth Amendment, innocent until proven guilty, but they are incarcerated uh, waiting for bail. Uh, so this is a, a reason that that we need to reevaluate the the bail system. Have it be more of a of a not not really um, for anything other than than a basic deposit. It shouldn't be something that that it, it's being used right now in in the way that it's punishment. It's punitive, um, and we need to definitely reevaluate that thinking that because essentially now it's just used to uh, judges can essentially have this huge control over over people that are in the in the trial system and and they are innocent. So yeah, I mean, basically, basically just a, a quick way to go in here and talk about how the bail system and, and money has, has stymied and created this, this, this real inequality in the criminal justice system for the, for the working class and the poor. Uh, just one more graphic. Uh, just we, we, we definitely know that the U.S. Uh, has, has this large incarceration rate. There's this graphic down here. So here, um, this is comparing Massachusetts and founding NATO countries on the incarceration rates. This is rates per 100,000 people. So uh, if you look at the country that's closest to us down the UK there, 129 per 100,000 people. Um, if you just look and see the United States is, is vastly ahead. Uh, Massachusetts, where we live, uh, is, is at 275, so lower than the national average. But still, we can just see here that, that people being incarcerated is as, as a major issue, the amount of people that are incarcerated in the U.S., and that's for nonviolent crimes. Bail is a big part of that because that's that's counting people, all the people that are incarcerated, including those people that are there pre-trial. They're innocent and they'll prove guilty, but they can't make cash bail or cash bail or other bail alternatives hasn't been made available to them. Uh, so just definitely something to think about because while we're not getting into it in this topic, uh, the 13th Amendment is that amendment that basically you know allows uh, prison jail labor that, that's essentially almost very similar to chattel slavery labor. And that all comes down into whether or not you can be uh, denied a bail because like, like I said, for the, the 13th Amendment, it's not only that kind of, of really – unfair working environment that that's being handed down to convicted felons which would be bad enough because that, that's not saying that convicted felons deserve that they do not but you can have people that are in jail innocent uh were, were not able to make their their bail but they're sitting there as an innocent person in jail being being used for that prison type labor and so as i understand it the under the 13th amendment they can actually be be forced to work that's correct. They can be compelled to work, and they can be withheld services within the within the prison. Not basic life services, but uh, quality of life services such as access to the commissary, the food store, uh, and and privileges. They can have privileges withheld in in in, in jail, and up to and including can be put into solitary confinement for refusing to work, which a lot of people in the prison abolishment uh, movement consider to be torture, solitary confinement. There's the whole basic concept of, of just trying to eliminate as much incarceration as, as we can. I think as a movement, that's what we need to be arguing for, is that the, the only people that should be incarcerated long term, if for years, are, are the rare breed of criminal that that are violent and truly dangerous to the public i i would estimate personally that that's a, a few percent of the people that are currently incarcerated and then for for the for the rest of the people i would say what we would want to do is is have some programs that are short-term intensive incarceration programs for say a few months 
where they would be in a, in, a, in a supervised environment learning job and life skills to help them rebuild their life when they get out. Again, not having people parked in, in jails for in prisons for years for nonviolent offenses, but uh, having a, a brief period in a correctional facility that helps them build up and reestablish when they get out. And of course, tie, tie it much more into the mental health system and the health system in general. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things I always bring up and tell people is that the number one provider of mental health care services in the United States is the Cook County Jail in Chicago, Illinois. That is the number one provider of mental health care services, not a hospital, is the Cook County Jail. So the, the, the criminal justice system has, has also become um, a catch-all for, for mental health and social services, which is a big problem the real driver of, of crime is is poverty absolutely yeah poverty should be looked at as a disease and and as as that as a societal failure as a societal failure yeah i also like to look at it as, as in terms of like of a disease though because i do think that poverty causes mental uh mental health problems and and substance use Men mental health issues do not cause people to to do criminal behaviors but substance use can um, so, you know, that's, that's, and, and substance use and mental, mental health, they, they, they do kind of coincide. I guess what I'm just trying to say is, is I, I'm, I'm absolutely not pushing a narrative that people with mental health problems are, are likely to commit crimes. It's not the case at all. In fact, people with mental health problems are far more likely to be victims of crimes than, than perpetrators of crimes. But yeah, all of those social issues that come with poverty can can create um, the quality of life crimes that people get incarcerated for all the time, especially in, in states with three strikes laws like California. Three felonies, no matter what they are, will get you a, a lifetime sentence. And also the when, when dealing with people that are criminal justice involved, that can also be a good uh, impetus for jobs programs mm -hmm. because th those those are jobs like working uh, in, in counseling and, and providing services and helping people out and also doing security and, and, you know, housing facilities and stuff like that, that can be awesome because, you know, de definitely, you know, like you're talking about people that are of a certain wealth class, they get lots of chances and lots of opportunities. And when, when they mess up, they get a little slap on the wrist and, and are kind of given some guidance. And that's something that we can be doing with, with, with people. And so um, the, the key isn't, isn't to be like like so angry about that that you want to tear the whole system down i i think that the key is to demand that that level of of care and, and of chances for, for everyone yeah the definitely. minimum oh yeah the, definitely the floor. i agree and with that we'll say crime and politics over and out we'll see you next time Corey. over and out see ya Corey. Hey, Eric. How's it going? Good. So, <laughs> oh, I did it, didn't I? <laughs> Cut. Oh, sorry. Wrong. Do it. No, it would be fine, but right. we started laughing. Yeah, it's hard not to say. <laughs>